I'm Chris aka The Philosopher's Games and I know some of you might have heard this intro multiple times by now, sorry for that, but for those who haven't, this little talking law video is part of a YouTube playlist and a larger collaboration between many YouTube law channels, big and small, for Talking Reading Day 2021. The topic is hope and courage. Of course, all videos also work as standalone videos. Shoutouts to all my fellow content creators who participate. Link to the playlist with all videos is in the description, in the cards and so on. It's worth watching. Before we start my usual disclaimer, I try to pronounce names as Tolkien described it, so prepare for some trilled R's. There's also something quite unusual about this law video. In an ancient age, after the two trees of Dor Rodun were destroyed, when sun and moon were still young, the oceans were not yet bent and at the time of the rise of the sons of Finwion, darkness fell upon the far east of Enor. Hildorian this land was called and there lived men, the Hildor, the followers, the aftercomers. Even though this land was a cradle of men, the memory of it was shrouded in fog like an age of darkness. It was a land of mystery, with a great coast and the mighty Orokarni, the red mountains north of it. It is said that on a time it chanced that Arau, or Bema as the Barmarach later called him, the huntsman of the Rodun, one of the high powers of Ardon, rode eastward in his hunting and he turned north by the shores of Helkar and passed under the shadows of the Orokarni, but that was long before men. These eastern lands were far away from the Rodun, the powers, and men only knew the powers as distant rumour told by the Morben, the dark elves they would later meet. The wise assume only Arau travelled these lands and Guyar sent some messages through the waters which he ruled, and though men laughed the waters and their hearts were stirred, but they understood not the messages. Arau's wild kine and mighty horses that can be found even ages later attest his journeys though. But one other of the Rodun haunted the Far East in ancient times as well. Many names he had, Bauglir, Beligur or Beligurth, the Great Death. A yoke he became for the Hildor beyond hope for many generations, expelled he was from the Rodun and his nihilistic hate of all that is drove him ever since. He reshaped and twisted creatures and peoples of Arzon to his will to create armies which would infest and destroy it. His own dark power he infused into Arzon, the world itself, and if he would succeed, he would ultimately also destroy his armies and creatures to undo all creation itself. If he could not create his own world, there should be none. Words cannot describe how horrible his nihilistic darkness oppressed the Hildor living in these distant eastern lands must have been. And men did not try to find words, they tried to forget, letting it become a foggy memory of a long forgotten dream. But they were not fully devoured by the darkness, at least not all. Some tribes tried to escape. They remembered when the first sun arose in the west and the opening eyes of men were turned towards it and their feet as they wandered over the earth for the most part straight that way. And so four tribes of the Hildor, the Atanatari, wandered west into the unknown with courage and hope for peace in their hearts. They were called the Atani or Edain. One tribe were the mysterious Druku, which looked quite different compared to the other men. They were shorter and their black eyes would glow red in their wrath, but they were Edain nonetheless and also later called Dru Edain. One of the four tribes was at some point led by Balan, it was later known as the Barbeora. One tribe was at some point led by Marach, later known as the Barmarach, and the last tribe was at some point known as the Haledrim or Haladin and was much later led by Haldat, but this was at the end of their journey. The names of the ancestors of those leaders or previous names for these tribes were long forgotten. 
though Aladdin meant warden and was a title for their leader as well. The Aladdin were a bit separated from the others during their journey. They spoke a different language compared to the other tribes and had some unusual customs. One of the strange practices spoken of was that many of their warriors were women, though few of these went abroad to fight in the great battles. They later met the Druku, maybe because they were a bit different compared to the other Edain too, the Haladin had a good relationship with them. As a result, they traveled together at some point. Though some of the Druku decided to settle around the mountains, they saw in the distance the Ered Nimrais. The others continued their way into the far west together with the Haladin. The Bar Beora and Bar Marach journeyed further north and were ahead, but met a giant sea, later known as the Sea of Prune, though not knowing of each other for some time. The Haladin only saw the storms of the sea in the far distance when they looked north. In these lands they also met the first Naugrim, short bearded people that lived in halls under the mountains, masterful at forming stone and metal. It was not unusual that some groups of the tribes settled down during the journey as the land was fair and they have traveled far. Far they have left the darkness behind already, at least they thought. Some of the Barmarach settled north in the forested wilderlands called Rovanion and some settled in Rhun. It was also around these lands where they met the Morben, who taught them a bit of their language and music, for men had as yet no teachers in the art save only the dark elves in the wildlands. One day after long travels they crossed a gap between the Hithaiglier and the Ered Nimrais, both gigantic mountain ranges, and journeyed through a mysterious but fair forest. The forest seemed to not end and large rivers crossed it. Tales mentioned that sometimes it was like the forest sung in a friendly voice or the trees seemed to move. The Haladin and Dru Edain enjoyed life in the forest and some settled down in it, most journeyed further though, now traveling northwest. Then when the forest thinned out a bit, the Haladin and the remaining Drukhu saw the Ered Luin, another large and massive mountain range in the distance, but also the Barbeora camped nearby, ready to continue their journey. The Bar Marach camped further north. The leader of the Haladin met with Balan, the leader of the Barbeora or House of Balan. They agreed that Balan and his people will cross the mountains first and send message if the passage was safe, then the Haladin would follow. Also the Bar Marach slowly traveled westward over the mountains as well. What strange lands would lie on the other side? Would they find what they hoped for? Haven't the powers made their feet stray that way? When they got message also the Haladin continued their journey and crossed the mountains over the Naugrim road that connected their two great cities of Tumunzahar and Gabilgathol under Eret Luin. The road left the mountains and followed the river Askar to a fort called Sarn Athrat where one could cross the river Gabilan in which the Askar flows. South of the road were large and green lands with many forests and seven rivers known as Osiriant, ideal for the Haladin. They were probably more numerous than the folk of Balan, but no certain count of them was ever made, for they came secretly in small parties and hid in the woods of Osiriant, where the Laigil showed them no friendship. And thus came the Haladin into Beleriand, but meeting the unfriendship of the Laigil, the green elves, they turned north and dwelt in Thargelion, in the country of Caranthia, son of Finwion. There for a time they had peace, and the people of Caranthia paid little heed to them. In that time a boy named Haldad was born. What these men, the Edain, did not know was that Beligor, the darkness they once fled from, had his eye upon Beleriand and dwelled in his new chief fortress Angband north of it, 
Udun, his old main fortress, was destroyed ages ago. Moreover, the Haladin had strife among themselves and Biligur, now aware of the coming of hostile men into Beleriand, sent his servants to afflict them. During this time the Haladin remained in Thargelion and were content. They settled and managed to live in the peace they hoped for, at least for some decades. Each group formed its own settlement, set apart and governed its own affairs and they were slow to unite as a result. Haldat also lived in one, married and had a family. He was a man who was masterful and fearless, probably well respected. But Beligur, seeing that by lies and deceit he could not yet wholly estrange elves and men, was filled with wrath and endeavoured to do men what hurt he could. Therefore he sent an orc raid and passing east it escaped the leaguer and came in stealth back over Eret Luin by the passes of the Naugrim road and fell upon the Haladin in the southern woods of the land of Karanthir. Haldar had twin children, Hales his daughter and Haldar his son. Haldar also had a son named Haldan. Among themselves they adhered to their own language and though of necessity they learned Sindarin for communication with the Eldar and the other Edain. Many spoke it hatingly and some of those who seldom went beyond the borders of their own woods did not use it at all. They did not willingly adopt new things or customs and retained many practices that seemed strange to the Eldar and the other Edain, with whom they had few dealings except in war. Nonetheless, they were esteemed as loyal allies and redoubtable warriors, though the companies that they sent to battle beyond their borders were small, for they were and remained to their end a small people, chiefly concerned to protect their own woodlands and they excelled in forest warfare. Indeed, for long even those orcs, specially trained for this, dared not to set foot near their borders. One of the strange practices spoken of was that many of their warriors were women. This custom was evidently ancient. Not due to their special situation in Beleriand and maybe rather a cause of their small numbers than its result, they increased in numbers far more slowly than the other Edain. Hardly more than was sufficient to replace the wastage of war, yet many of their women, who were fewer than the men, remained unwed. When now the huge orc raid sent by Beligur reached the settlement it looked grim. But when hope seems lost, courage must answer. Haldard gathered all the brave men that he could find and retreated to the angle of land between Asgar and Gelion. And in the utmost corner he built a stockade across from water to water and behind it they let all the women and children they could save. There they were besieged until their food was gone. They were trapped and had to fight with all their courage. Not only Haldat but also his daughter Hales and son Haldar had to fight. Both were valiant in the defense for Hales was a woman of great heart and strength. She was described as an Amazon but the power and hatred of Beligur that fueled the creatures he sent was too strong. Haldat was slain in a sortie against orcs and Haldar who rushed out to save his father's body from the butchery was hewn down beside him. Then Hales held the people together though they were without hope and some cast themselves in the rivers and were drowned. But seven days later as the orcs made their last assault and had already broken through the stockade, there came suddenly a music of trumpets and Karanthir with his host came down from the north and drove the orcs into the rivers. Then Karanthir looked kindly upon men and did Hales great honor and he offered her recompense for her father and brother. And seeing over late what valor there was in the Edain, he said to her, If you will remove and dwell further north, there you shall have the friendship and protection of the Eldar and free lands of your own. But Hales was proud and unwilling to be guided or ruled and most of the Haladin were of like mood. Therefore she thanked Karanthir but answered, 
My mind is now set, Lord, to leave the shadow of the mountains and go west, whither others of our kin have gone. When therefore the Haladin had gathered all whom they could find alive of their folk, who had fled wild into the woods before the orcs, and had gleaned what remained of their goods in their burnt homesteads, they took Hales for their chief, and she led them at least to Estolat, and there dwelt for a time. And from that time on the Haladin were known as the house of Hales, and their chieftainess Hales was a renowned Amazon with a picked bodyguard of women. But they remained a people apart and were ever after known to elves and men as the people of Hales. Hales remained their chief while her days lasted, but she did not wed and the headship afterwards passed to Haldan, son of Haldar, her brother. Though the journey of Hales and her people did not end here, they travelled further west and reached the forest of Brethil after crossing a very dangerous plain called Nandungorthep, which means Valley of Dreadful Death in the shadow of the Ered Gorgoroth, the Mountains of Terror. Hales only brought her people through it with hardship and loss, constraining them to go forward by the strength of her will. And many bitterly repented of their journey, but there was no returning. After they reached Brethil, some settled further south, as far as Nargothrond, realm of King Finrod. But there were many who loved the Lady Harless and wished to go whither she would and dwell under her rule. Now Brethil is part of the realm Dorias of the elven king Thingol, and he was first against the Edain settling in his forest, but Finrod was a friend of men and a friend of Thingol, and after hearing of all that had befallen the people of Harles obtained this grace for her. The house of Harles should protect the forest and river crossing from the forces of Beligur, and therefore could dwell in Brethil. To this Harles answered, Where are Haldat my father, Haldar my brother? If the king of Dorias fears a friendship between Harles and those who have devoured her kin, then the swords of the Eldar are strange to men. And Harles dwelt in Brethil until she died, and her people raised a green mound over her in the heights of the forest, Tur Haretha, the Lady Barrow, Hauzenarwen in the Sindarin tongue, and among the people of Harles lived still some of the Druku in peace. Few people were put into such hardship and survived, but also few had so much courage. They hoped for peace and a better life in the west, fleeing from the darkness, found and lost it again, continued to fight against all odds and found new hope. Darkness always seems to follow, but there's always hope. In the end the story takes a sad ending though, as Turin and his father Hurin, both horribly cursed by Biligur or Morgos as most will call him, will bring doom and utter destruction over the house of Harles. The few survivors of them are scattered through the land, a few Druidine survive and can flee to the havens of Sirion, but the house of Harles is no more. One could say all the courage, all the hope, for nothing? But hope is not so easily defeated. The grandson of Harles' twin brother had many children, also a daughter named Hareth. She is no other than the mother of Hurin, but she is also the mother of Huor. While Hurin's line ends dramatically in the grim story of the children of Hurin, Huor's line continues, whose father is also from the house of Marach. And over his son Tuor, whose mother is from the house of Balan or the house of Beor, all Edain houses are united, and one of the big half-elven lines begins with Tuor's son Earendil, who also has twins, Elrond and Elros. And through Elros' line, two ages later, a boy is born. He is called Estel, which means hope. You might know this man later as Strider. And I'm sure he inherited a bit of Haldat's and Hales' strength and courage. Thank you for watching.
I hope you enjoyed this episode. For people wondering, I tried to use some of the lesser known names for persons, places and groups, often Sindari names, to maybe confuse and make people wonder what I'm talking about at the beginning. Slowly I use more and more familiar names throughout the text. The idea was to paint a certain mood that feels ancient, a bit alien or unusual, even for Tolkien fans and very mythological, because that is how I imagine this ancient journey of the Edain. I focused on telling the story and used all kinds of sources and tried to make them fit. This could need further discussion though. In the woods I referenced Tom Bombadil and the ants, but this was made up by myself. It's maybe plausible, but there is no mention in any of Tolkien's texts I know about. I just thought it would be a cool reference. I also took some inspiration from an unrelated film. Curious if someone gets the reference. Also a lot of passages from the video are direct quotes from the books. Sometimes I just change the names to fit my text. Some parts I wrote myself too to connect all of it. It was a bit experimental and I hope it worked out and was fun to watch. Also thank you to Kimberly80, Ted Nasmith, Sarah Morello Art and Bene for allowing me to use their amazing artworks. Links to their galleries are in the description. Please check the other videos in the playlist for Tolkien Reading Day 2021 too. The link is in the description. It's as mentioned a collaboration between many Tolkien law YouTubers. If you like this one, maybe check my other content. Recommend me further, leave a like and a comment, subscribe, check my Twitch channel, you know what to do. If you like Man of the West, Nerd of the Rings and Voice of Geekdom, I also have podcast episodes with them as guests, available on my channel. Next will be a video about Elrond, but enough advertisement, much fun with the other videos. Again, thank you for watching and goodbye.